pass it. That's fine. Thank you. Hi, if everyone can take their seats, we're going to start in just one minute. Cheers. Hello, hi, welcome everybody. Um, we're delighted to be here at the International Degrowth Conference in Zagreb. Uh, welcome to our panel on the geopolitics of post-growth. Um, what are we going to be talking about this evening? Um, geopolitics might not always be on a, a degrowth panel uh, or at a degrowth conference, perhaps unexpected. Um, but geopolitics is more and more part of the reality we live in, and so it, so is degrowth, uh, as as we've been discussing already, and I'm sure as we'll be discussing over the next few days. Degrowth, post-growth is getting growing, growing recognition as a political movement, as a political uh, demand, and as a way of thinking about our future. Um, and one of the starting points for this panel is that um, any such political proposition also comes with and also needs to have uh, geopolitical thinking worked into it as, as well. Um, I mentioned geopolitics is back. Um, we see that uh, most uh, tragically with the, with the war in Ukraine, um, and especially after last year's invasion. We also see it in just growing tensions around the world, uh, tensions between China and the United States, uh, it's not only about the big powers all over the world. The way governments are, are thinking about their policies is increasingly taking on a, a geopolitical lens. Um, and yeah, I said that degrowth might not instantly be connected with uh, geopolitics, but if you think of uh, degrowth as a way of uh, reflecting on what you really need as a community, as a political community, uh, what you depend on, how much energy you use, where you get it. You see that degrowth cannot not be about geopolitics and the two things are very much in dialogue uh, with one another. So that's the starting point for our discussion. Um, and geopolitics of post-growth is also a project that the Green European Foundation has been working on uh, throughout uh, this year. Um, now I'm going to introduce the panel. Uh, I'm not sure if I introduce myself. I'm Jamie Kendrick. Editor uh, in chief of the Green European Journal. Um, starting on my left, um, we have Hadja Kamliki, who's a sustainability uh, advocate and activist um, who works especially on the Middle East and North Africa region. Um, also have with me uh, Gwendolyn delbos Caulfield, who's a member of the European Parliament um, for the Greens uh, EFA group, works um, on issues especially around democracy, around civil liberties, and she's also a board member of the Green European Foundation. Um, then I have Olga Boyko to, immediately to my right, who is a climate coordinator um, for the Climate Action Network, working especially on the Eastern Europe, Caucasus and Central Asia region. Um, and then on the most right, not the far right, we have um, Richard uh, Walters, who is a think tanker um, at the think tank associated with the Dutch Green Party, and he's also um, the lead researcher working on the geopolitics of post-growth project um, for the Green European Foundation. Um, so we're going to begin with uh, just a round of statements, um, bringing in different perspectives on the intersection between geopolitics and post-growth, regional perspectives, um, effective work, based on what the various panelists are working on. 
then we'll have a round of questions between ourselves, um, and then we'll also have a good uh, half an hour at the end of the session to uh, get everyone involved, have contributions and questions, and uh, we're looking forward to that part. Um, so I would like to begin uh, by passing the floor to Olga um, and um, for her contribution, please. Okay. Um, so I guess uh, I would generally reflect on the state of things currently and, and my observations uh, that could uh, that could connect to the topic of uh, geopolitics in degrowth, uh, but intertwined with my personal experience, um, as I am not a researcher on degrowth, for example, but uh, a network coordinator, and uh, I do work with most uh, with the, both Ukrainian NGOs that deal with climate change and, and, and sustainability and energy issues, but also the region that is uh, a big mystery sometimes for uh, a larger international community, uh, which is Caucasus and Central Asia. And we do have Russia as well included in that region in the network, and we are part of uh, CAN uh, Climate Action Network. So uh, obviously the invasion last year has not only shaken up the European community, uh, the waves uh, spread out really fast inside the region of Eastern Europe, Caucasus, of Central Asia, and you must understand that um, it's obviously a very different view from, from the inside and from the outside, and uh, if most of the focus and most of the media attention and discussions and reflections and, and, and thoughts were focused on Ukraine and uh, the relationships with Russia and what, what would be the right thing to do, how to achieve peace, what is happening, what was in 2014, etc., cetera, um, and what it means for Ukraine and the EU relationship, so that was obviously in the center of the discussion. But what I think is being also overlooked in many cases is how uh, the full-scale invasion influenced the, uh, the geopolitics inside the region, meaning the relationships between Russia and countries, namely Moldova, Georgia, uh, I would not probably mention Belarus in this case, but also like Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, which is a strategical, uh, historical uh, uh, field of interest and field of influence for Russia. Cultural, economical, you name it, educational, um, etc. So I would uh, try and get a bit more uh, into that direction as well of, the, of the, these regions' perspective and what is changing in uh, those countries in relation to their dependency and their relations to Russia, but also their relations to the EU and their self-determination, um, self uh, uh, if I can put it like that, because all of these countries basically gained independence, uh, same as Ukraine, in, uh, 32 years ago. And uh, a lot of them are not in, uh, obviously in the same position, being so close to the EU. So the institutions, the civil society, um, all of that I would like to touch upon a bit later when I have a chance. Um, but just to um, maybe spo spoil it a little bit, um, there is a, a, a rising discussion on uh, the, being more independent from Russia. But does it also mean being more dependent on other regions and on the EU, for example? So that's something that is uh, very up in the air right now in the region. And I think that this would also influence very much all of the discussions on the, the future sustainability and the degrowth in Europe. Um, because this region is, uh, yeah, it's still uh, rich on resources and uh, it's still not being perceived as um, as equal in terms of politics and um, in other cases in terms of economics. So yeah, there's, the, there's already this uh, beginning of, of thinking how would it change the relationships and how would it influence the, the geopolitics in general with Russia losing its influence in the region. Thank you very much. Um, now uh, I'd like to turn to uh, Gwendolyn and ask um, about the EU specifically. EU is in started thinking a lot more geopolitically. It maybe started with COVID. Um, it's obviously started do doing a, a lot more in terms of defense and thinking in terms of geopolitics since the full-scale invasion of, of Ukraine. Because energy and, and, and other dependencies are all, are all very much part of these questions, has this in any way been a, a kind of breach or an opening for 
uh, degrowth style policies or demands, or would that be mis misreading it? Yes, I think that already with the COVID situation um, and even more with the Ukraine war and the fact that there was this big urge to stop the dependency to Russian energy, there was a bit of wishful hope and thinking from some of us that maybe at last it would bring uh, the, the importance of sobriety and the importance of, of planetary boundings and boundaries and all this uh, to be priority. I, I think that this, this is still wishful thinking. Um, I think that it has made a little, very little progress. We do have words that were nasty words that you will now find in text, so it's always a, a good evolution. It's like when the word gender came in or, you know, ni nice words that come in. So it's a first start, but it's really just on words today. I think that we can see that the energy is more an energy shifting than an energy reduction. The idea is uh, now to find the energy elsewhere, maybe in Saudi Arabia, uh, and, and, and it's not, and it's still fossil fuel. So I don't think that there is a very little thinking about reduction, but that's only part of the thinking. Most of the thinking is how we do, uh, we, we bring energy from elsewhere than Russia and we dependent, in fact, from others. Uh, I think that we could illustrate it also with the big debate at the moment, the very, very, very difficult one that we're having on the European level, specifically in the Parliament, but it's also in the Commission, the Council, the, the member states and all of this, between the question between biodiversity and agriculture and how this is always put once against the other with this idea that those of us that say we need to sanctify certain areas and we need to keep them for nature, we are going against the well-being of all the world that of course Europe is supposed to feed because we are supposed, and Ukraine specifically and others are supposed to bring grains to Africa and all of this and how selfish we are to want to specifically have places for, for, for biodiversity. I also think that of of course, one of the big answers that people like to have in the European Parliament and in European Union in general is new technology and new ways of, of keeping the same model of life and of consumption, but with new technology. So I also think that this is one of the problems. Um, I also think that we should be careful, second point, because I think that it goes along with big question about democracy, rule of law, authoritarianism. As I said, I mean, we are just shifting from one authoritarian country, Russia, to be dependent with other authoritarian countries. So this is really a big uh, question. I'm also, I also want to stress the fact that one country came out very well in this story. This country is Poland, and now Poland is the big friend. Poland is wonderful. Poland is the first one that wanted to fight for Ukraine and all this, forgetting everything that happened in, in Poland. And we have a bit of this geopolitical problem that maybe sometimes those that are against Russia will be our allies anyway, whatever they do. So I think that that is another question. And we can see it in the debate of enlargement. We also have now people saying we must maybe not be that picky about enlargement and we can get it everyone, even if they're not completely democracy uh, right, because it would always be better than Russia. And then third thing is that it has never been thought, of course, with the participation of citizens. It's big, elaborated thing that I thought through at the European level and then we don't imply uh, uh, people on the ground and so we know that when we do that we don't do policies that are useful and I will finish this with a third point that I find very important in all of this discussion which is the gender um, aspect and I'm saying I was saying you know you don't involve citizen well specifically you don't involve the gender uh, uh, question on this and then you make the big mistakes I think we have a big concern about the fact that the next big energy policies will be very unfair for women and will aggravate sit the situation for women. One example, and, and I'm, I mean I'm a Green, I come from Green parties in the cities where we have Mayora, where we are, we, 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 we are in power, we are putting in place things that are very important and we should be because we have the pollution problem and all this, so we are forbidding old cars, 
we are uh, asking people to change the energy and all this, but who has the old cars? Who are the ones that never bought a new, fresh, wonderful car and have the old cars and, and pollute? They are women. And, and specifically, you have all of these little jobs like nursing, liberal nurses, um, or all of these little shops in center town centers. And if we don't think parallel to these forbidding uh, rules, we don't think how we accompany these people, we will aggravate the gender issue. Um, again, when we think about degrowth and energy changes, sometimes the idea in our governments, very bad idea, is to put big investment in big energy sectors. This, these are masculine sectors, of course. And then we have, of course, I think this is a very geopolitical question. We have, of course, um, the Ukraine war brought that also. We have, of course, uh, and, and it was already the case for a few years with countries that have a big problem of um, demography and more and more we are also on one hand not wanting to migrants to come in anymore we are wanting uh, uh, our communities to be self-sufficient and we are thinking that the woman body once again can be the body that can um, uh, bring the solution to all of this rather than think the geopolitical situation and how we could find other solutions so i think that we should be uh, very aware of all of this. Uh, once again, I think first steps have been made, but we are at the very, very start and still thinking that we should uh, restrain our, our, our lifestyle is really, really not the majority thinking in the European Union. Thank you, thank you. So um, we might have seen the first bit of intersection between uh, degrowth thinking and, uh, and geopolitical thinking, but it's nowhere near the systemic critique and, and call for a different way of organizing and different way of living that, that is integral to degrowth as well. Um, I'd now like to bring in Hajar and um, ask about, first of all, um, as it's also a geopolitical question in of itself, what about uh, what are the impacts of climate change on the countries of uh, Middle East, North Africa specifically, and what what would be the consequence of a post-growth Europe for some of these countries? And can does talking about a post-growth trajectory for for countries like I don't know Morocco, for example, where you're from, does that make sense? Thank you, Jamie. Let me just approach because my voice is low, quite low. So, well, let's say that uh, the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa are one of the most uh, vulnerable uh, regions in the world related uh, to climate change. Uh, the Mediterranean basin in its own, it is like a hotspot and uh, exposed to plus 20% more uh, heating than the other regions of the world. And that brings us of the more vulnerability of the southern coast of this Mediterranean, which is the MENA region, that is arid and semi-arid environment. So the first things that hits us is, of course, the increased temperatures, the heat waves. And when we talk about heat waves, so we're going to say in the water scarcity, the drought, so that will uh, will bring us to agricultural problems, food uh, uh, food security issues. Uh, that also uh, will bring us to uh, displacement and migration uh, issues because. There is no uh, no more resources available within the region. No arable lands. No enough water. A high ener higher energy, more and more energy demand for cooling, and which is not available for everyone. Let's say the energy access or energy poverty. For I'm talking region wise, region wise is uh, is uh, not negligible. So it's uh, quite uh, uh, more than the average uh, rates. So. Those have as well an impact on health. Let's say when we have water scarcity, the roughness, we have a lot of heat, so we are exposed to more uh, waterborne uh, diseases and heat related diseases as well. So, yeah, this in generally, because if I want to go on more details, it will be a lecture like our dear colleague gave us yesterday. I think it was quite clarifying how the 
emergency and how uh, several regions are sensible, but our region is like uh, very, very impacted with it, uh, within it. Uh, that, uh, of course, this vulnerability uh, is uh, it's to add to other uh, uh, more socio-economical impacts. So all the socio-economic impacts that comes with climate change, again, the gender integration, the most impacted are women, then the economic development. And I know this is not uh, your favorite word to use in a new, within a degrowth conference, but just to bring me to a comment I, would like, I shared to the, with the colleagues uh, earlier and I wanted to share because I am new to the I'm climate person. I'm, I have been always an environmental and climate person. So coming to the degrowth at first, it, to ask, trying to understand what it is, so it speaks to me as sustainable development. So yeah, we are talking about like uh, environmental, uh, uh, protecting the environment and the resource, preserving the resources, uh, developing, uh, taking care of the people and putting them in, advancing them in the agenda and uh, as well, let's keep our, our economic development. So what the difference that I got to understand a little more that it is more than that. It is more as well for political, where a political current, but I say development, it's, it's quite speaks to me because for us, we are not that developed, <laughs> of course. We are not in that level of development, so we are thinking to shrink it and degrow it, so to be more useful. We're still trying to uh, figure things out, but our resources are are uh, 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 are used or taken advantage of by other countries, and we are not in a quite equilibrium. There are no balance within this this uh, this uh, uh, this operation or this transaction. So this take us yes, it is an interesting uh, thing to think of, but it if brings me the two, two question. I'm, yeah, I'm gonna just. I'm not going to be long, but there is two perspectives. You asked about the first one, what is the impact if Europe decides to go for this uh, degrowth, post-degrowth? We know that uh, there is a strong and complex relationships between the European Union and the MENA region. And uh, it is influenced, of course, by various actors. Like there is uh, economic interdependence, very strong economic interdependence. Let's say that m most of North African countries and uh, some of the Levants have those uh, rely a lot on the EU and little, uh, much, much less on the Eastern Mediterranean or other uh, other countries like uh, China, Russia, or uh, or uh, or, uh, or the US. Uh, we have this the resource dynamic that is going on between EU and the, uh, if EU not decides to go for degrowth, so the resource dynamic will have uh, will will have will will change significantly, and that brings us to the geopolitical relationships because. There is the economic repercussions on trades, exports, the tourism, for example. If uh, there is degrowth policy that's, uh, that says that we need to decrease the tourism, so there is no enough tourism for the southern countries that rely highly economically a lot on it. And it is for some of their country, this is the main economical uh, income for it. That's just one of many, many, many others. Uh, we, the energy transition uh, is like a huge, huge component of this dynamic because uh, it will spark competition over uh, renewable energy markets. We, are, we will not find now a European Union uh, asking for energy from uh, abroad from uh, from the southern uh, that is which is one of the highest motivations of those countries to start the renewable energies uh, and the energy transition at first because we know let's say it's clear that there is a huge uh, a significant advancement in energy policies uh, when, uh, within the region but if i'm talking about uh, north africa and levant um, 
I can say it, North Africa has been motivated because of this renewable energy trade to sell renewable energy to Europe, to sell green hydrogen to Europe. Any, anything that is going to develop is for the European market. And that was uh, the decision making factors for, uh, for the countries. Then we can, as a civil society, as movement afterward to talk, let's to say, hey, people, we need our this renewable energy for us at first. Let's satisfy our domestic needs. We need more renewable energy, less cost of energy. We need to have it affordable for, for, for our people, for rural areas. Let's go more on the, the centralized and decentralized approaches to satisfy us and give us less costly energy. Then you can envisage and pro project to export because the countries need this currency, foreign currency, need this development for other projects because it has to invest in social care, education, and so on. So all the people uh, area within this, uh, <laughs> this uh, transaction, it's very weak in the MENA region and it relies on incomes. So to have this public money to invest in the people care. So yes, yet the, the interaction is very, very complicated, but uh, if we take it from the other side, yeah, as, you, as you ask, if you can say yet, what will happen if countries in the MENA region decides to go for degrowth? So there will be a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities as well. And uh, because we, some of the MENA regions uh, rely a lot on oil and gas exports. Uh, we can say Al Algeria, beyond the GCC, the classical ones, of course, but GCC are stronger or not. They are fighting for uh, diversifying their economies to beyond oil and gas. Uh, still uh, not the brightest part, but they are trying to. But what happens with Egypt, uh, Algeria, and uh, uh, Libya, or other countries that are not that strong, are not that rich, but already built the economical model to deliver to their gas or fossil fuels to, uh, to the, northern, the northern countries. So this will, be, uh, this will uh, spark a new dynamic and a critical uh, social, social and economical impact for to, to, to transition and to go beyond this, uh, beyond, uh, beyond this, uh, uh, these obstacles. And that will take time. It's not, uh, it's not something that will happen uh, very easily. There is a geopolitical conflict, one of the main challenges. Uh, lot, yeah, one minute. I'm going to be, be, be very quick. The, the geopolitical conflicts, you know, in region, there is a lot of political conflicts uh, over power struggles uh, that comes around resources, uh, territories, uh, influence, and so on. So implementing degrowth uh, measures could potentially require this, a lot of cooperation between uh, and coordination between uh, these regions. And this might be very challenging and will be a very tense geopolitical environment to advance. It is indeed could be as well an opportunity if taken in, in, uh, in, a, different, uh, in a different way. We have the international investment and assistance. Uh, international aid and investments are uh, very present in the region, so development aid is much conditioned uh, on certain policies. It, and those policies potentially are impacting uh, the degrowth strategies. So this is a thing to think of from uh, the other side as well. Uh, the social stability, the employment concerns, the region has very high unemployment concerns. And uh, to address with new degrowth strategies to address it, that would be very challenging because the, the region is, has more than 50% of youth uh, population. And this youth population, the, the, the rates of unemployment are like uh, uh, scandalous, and the women and uh, women employment is less than 20%. So 
so those uh, things are issues are uh, are really highly uh, to address and need to be balanced in the new model. So there is, yeah, I'm gonna continue at this one. Okay. So thanks, thanks, Hajia. And um, some of those final points are some of the things that I'd also like uh, you to come in on, Richard, especially around how degrowth interacts with um, the energy transition in Europe's relation with exporters around the world. Yes, thank you, Jamie. Um, I will start with some general remarks about geopolitics and degrowth, and then indeed zoom in on. Uh, Europe's uh, relationship with the Global South. Um, for the European Union, in my view, um, geopolitics can never be just about um, interests. It also has to reflect its values and, uh, and aims. And these include human rights, uh, democracy, and the international rule of law. That's why we help uh, Ukraine defend itself against uh, the Russian aggressor. It's not just about our security. Um, it's also our values which are uh, at stake. Ukraine is the victim of an imperialist and colonial attack by uh, Russia in the grip of toxic mas masculinity, uh, a cult of violence with uh, Wagner's, Wagner's uh, sledgehammer as a horrific uh, symbol. We must resist uh, imperialism and colonialism also when Russia is the perpetrator. Um, I think this cannot be re um, repeated often enough in uh, degrowth circles. Um, the global aims of the European Union also include uh, sustainable development and the er eradication of poverty, according to the EU treaty. Um, evidence, of course, is piling up that if you want to avoid ecological breakdown and free up natural resources for the Global South, the EU and other rich countries need to stop chasing economic growth. Um, and that's why uh, geopolitical thinking needs to take degrowth uh, seriously, in my view. And again, it's not just our values, but also our interests that are at stake. An EU that renounces economic growth might gain in resilience, at least in some respects. Um, it is better to manage the end of growth through democratic deliberations than to have it imposed on us by ecological breakdown or resource conflicts. That's an important lesson from uh, degrowth thinking, especially since these resource conflicts are already there. Uh, Russia turning off the gas tap, uh, China limiting its exports of uh, critical metals. The EU is very vulnerable to blackmail over resources because we import so much energy and materials from uh, third countries. Um, Putin thought that he could get away with his invasion of Ukraine because the EU was so dependent on Russian gas. Uh, that was a miscalculation, but he did unleash an energy crisis that undermined the livelihoods of many Europeans, forcing some to choose between eating and heating. And in response, the EU has accelerated its transition to renewable energies, but that only makes us more dependent on China, another aggressive autocracy. China dominates the supply chains for critical metals, um, as well as for solar panels, batteries, and magnets that are made from these metals. Uh, thus, we appear to be stuck between two aggressive uh, autocracies. Um, Degrowth policies would make it easier to break free from this catch-22. Uh, one degrowth policy in particular stands out, and that is reducing private car ownership. Not replacing every fossil fuel car by an electric car, but uh, promoting cycling, public transport, and shared electric vehicles. Um, if one electric car were enough to replace five fossil fuel cars, the EU would only need half as much lithium for batteries as is currently uh, projected. We would still need lots of lithium, though. Uh, even in this degrowth uh, scenario, EU demand for lithium might increase sixfold between now and 2030. And we would also need more cobalt and copper and rare earth metals to complete our energy transition. 
Uh, as Greens, we love to talk about recycling, um, and it is important, but there is simply not enough lithium and cobalt, etc., circulating in our economy at the moment to um, meet the needs of the um, energy transition, even if the EU would embrace degrowth. Um, also, only a small part of these energy metals will come from mines in uh, Europe, if only because it takes time to open up uh, new mines. Uh, the European Commission estimates that by 2030 we can have about 10% of our metals from uh, European uh, mines. Um, so that leaves 90% uh, and that's where the Global South uh, comes in. Uh, all over the world resource-rich countries uh, like uh, Chile and Indonesia are aware that the energy transition is uh, redrawing the geopolitical map and they want to benefit from it. Um, and the EU, for its part, sees an opportunity to diversify its supply of energy metals to become less dependent on China. So the EU is offering strategic partnerships to resource-rich countries that can provide it with uh, the metals it needs. And it is becoming increasingly clear that these partnerships will have to include value addition uh, in the mining countries. Um, in our key, keynote yesterday, uh, Diana urge vorsatz suggested that factories that make batteries for electric ve vehicles should be built uh, next to rich neighborhoods so that people driving electric cars become aware that uh, they're not completely uh, clean, they have an environmental price uh, too. But if you ask the governments of uh, uh, Chile or Indonesia, mind you, democratic governments, um, they would say, say uh, no, these battery factories should be built in our country. We do not want to simply export metal ores uh, to you. We want to process them within our own borders. Battery production is far more profitable than mining, uh, and it creates better jobs. And given our need for energy metals, uh, these countries have a strong negotiating position. Uh, Chile and Indonesia might get what they want. Uh, in fact, Indonesia is already building uh, battery factories with the help of foreign uh, investors. Um, so this still fulfills the European geopolitical goal of diversifying its supply chains, becoming less dependent on China, but it's still an uncomfortable, uncomfortable scenario, I think, for degrowthers. On the one hand, uh, you have transfer of technology to the global south, you have industrial development, you have better jobs, but on the other hand, it's not a clean break with extractivism. Um, in order to kick the habit of fossil fuels, even a post-growth EU would still import uh, products from metal mining in the global south, um, with all the uh, destruction that comes uh, uh, with it, because there's no such thing as sustainable mining. Uh, the best we can aim for is uh, responsible uh, mining. Perhaps one last remark. Um, many countries in the Global South uh, refuse to see the Russian invasion uh, for what it is, an imperialist colonial attack by a regime that has no regard for international law. Uh, many in the Global South associate imperialism and colonialism exclusively with Western Europe and the United States. So there is still a lot of pain and resentment to be addressed. And that requires apologies for slavery and colonialism, debt relief, investments in global public goods, uh, climate finance, and so on. But it also requires a certain modesty from us. Uh, yes, we in Europe need to move beyond growth, um, but we must be careful not to impose any particular model of development on the Global South. If the governments of Chile and Indonesia, democratic governments, want to, be, to build batteries for us, uh, batteries that we do need even in the post-growth uh, Europe, who are we to say that we know better? We've done that for far too long. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to pose a two-way question uh, to the panel. What, uh, one, um, 
about about defense, about military defense, um, if countries in Europe or for that matter Latin America want to break with growth um, and countries such as Russia, China or the United States continue to invest a significant part of their GDP in uh, weapons and militaries, are they less secure, less independent? Is there a a built-in growth dynamic to uh, big power geopolitics. And on the other hand, it's the same question in the other direction, if we consider degrowth as the absolute priority to protect a stable planet, if we need to reduce the material and energy throughput of our societies, our economies, are there some foreign policy consequences that come with that that we just have to accept um, so, um, from both directions, what's the relationship between degrowth, post-growth, and uh, and the competition between countries, uh, including geopolitical competition? Okay, so I'm I'm not sure I will cover 100% of the of the, of the the suicide question, but um, I want to paint a picture of. Uh, of the problem that, uh, that that stays in the way of any kind of uh, reforms, uh, ethical reforms, sustainable development, etc. Because um, when we work, um, or we say we work with the climate policy or try to influence climate policy in the region of Eastern Europe, Caucasus, and Central Asia, um, we might. I might have thought that I do that at first, but then with some time you understand that um, this is the second uh, step or a third step of uh, helping uh, the CSOs to get more um, more influential and to make some analysis, modeling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At first, you need to check whether there are any CSOs at all and whether they can. Um, speak out freely and whether they have any funding um, and uh, legal opportunities to actually work and uh, get this kind of information. So for me, and I don't know if this is the kind of um, being in a climate movement for eight years or um, living in a country that it's war, but I do believe climate scientists, so uh, I don't just make this conclusion from my own experience. And I honestly don't think that it will necessarily get easier. I do think that we need to be more strong and prepared to actually deal with the next crisis or multiple crises, as we're all uh, saying right now, because they will come and, and, and it's already happening. So there's, uh, there's, a different, there's different levels that um, we need to deal with uh, from uh, the conflicts and wars uh, to the natural disasters, um, equalities, uh, the uh, rich versus the poor percentage of the population, etc., etc., health crisis, pandemics, and so on. And uh, because I do believe in climate, uh, climate science, I, I do not foresee like a, a silver lining in, in, in five or ten years when we um, suddenly have the climate neutrality and, and, and everything is well and we can relax. I don't think we can ever relax, but it doesn't mean that we need to give up. It doesn't mean that uh, we tried everything and it didn't work and well. Um, so for me, I see two most important uh, recipes for actually trying to become more strong and be able actually and capable to uh, address those challenges, economic, political, military, etc. because we will need to defend ourselves. But believe me when I say this, I would really not like the, the, the world where most of the budget the countries need to spend on weapons. This is not the world uh, I want to live in. And But we do need to be able to cope with with the with the migration crisis and and agricultural um, difficulties that come with climate change, etc. You know it. Um, and these two recipes, or the, rather two components of a recipe, for me uh, and what I've seen uh, in the in the region, what is lacking is strong civil society and decentralization. 
And partially, that's what I've also seen working in Ukraine. Not ideally, obviously, there's, there's no ideal example, I don't think so. But that is exactly what the uh, so-called post-Soviet uh, region was lacking for the past hundred of years because it was actively um, forbidden and fought with. So the idea that uh, you can get like uh, a group of people and uh, criticize some decisions of, of, of the government, uh, suggest some reforms and then actually get it, is, was not something you would think about. Or like even the thought of that would make you probably question your sanity and, and, and you would feel scared. Um, and then the decentralization is obviously the opposite of what the countries of the Eastern Europe, Caucasus and Central Asia have been experiencing for the past hundred of years. And um, obviously those who managed to maintain some, some part of, uh, some extent of, of decentralization, again, uh, talking about Ukraine, for example, um, are, most, uh, are more uh, resilient in any kind of crisis. Because what I've seen after 24th of February was this sudden awakening of people who maybe even did not realize that they were part of civil society. They were just, uh, you know, just, uh, uh, I was just Olga, right? Obviously, I was part and I, I did understand, but you know, you are just you and you have your life, your plans for the day, and, and your plans for tomorrow, etc. But suddenly, you, you realize when you are faced with a, uh, with a problem that, okay, I'm not alone, there's actually neighbors, and, and, and we can make a chat, and we can discuss something, we can prepare, etc., etc. And from this small level, and taking some responsibility and understanding that you are not uh, a subject, but uh, not an object, but a subject, um, comes like ve very maybe m very, m maybe not very um, um, maybe you don't notice it at first, but it is spreading. You know this kind of power from the ground that we also like to talk about in climate movement. That something that we we like to to invest in of having the um, local movements and, and, and the, uh, yeah, the, the grassroots movements. Um, so the, the, the strong civil society combined with uh, decentralization, obviously ideally on the political level, but when it's not possible, then at least you know, starting somewhere, uh, could be a good recipe for actually dealing with the crises that are coming. And I would add a, a kind of a, a pinch of salt on here in a good way, actually, um, as, a, as a seasoning, because there's also a huge need in, in the countries where they don't exist for strong institutions. And again, coming to the history of, of the of the Soviet regime is basically something that was not supported in any way by Moscow because Moscow was only Moscow was allowed to be a strong institution and the decision making body. All of the other countries had to uh, be be able to implement the policies um, imposed by uh, by the Moscow. So obviously those countries are going through waves of shocks. There are also revolutions that are changing the governments. For example, in Kyrgyzstan in the past 20 years, there were three revolutions after which the president changed. But obviously, uh, the revolutions do not guarantee you a good uh, result and, 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 and new strong institutions. You have to do so much work in between and not in, not in all of the countries it is actually going just up and up and getting better and better. There, there are waves and even in Georgia that is considered to be quite democratic country, uh, striving to be a EU member uh, at some point, uh, there were uh, there was a, a revolution, uh, a lot of protests in March this year because the government wanted to implement the foreign agent law, um, as Georgians called it, Russian law, which would control uh, the civil society organizations in terms of where they get their funding. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a very popular tool that is being copied. The law is just being translated into different languages from the Russian language. Uh, I do know that uh, it is what's happened in Nicaragua as well two years ago, also during March of 2022, when a lot of NGOs, environmental NGOs, were just closed. So uh, there, there's all these challenges, but when we try and imagine, okay, w um, not only how the world should look like, that we would like to see and live in, but actually how do we look like? What do we do? What kind of skills do we have to have in order to, to deal with the world that is, um, that is around us? 
uh, I would say that the strong civil society, the decentralization and uh, strong institutions, meaning like ministries and also um, uh, courts, etc. So uh, without that, uh, it would be really, really difficult. And then we would need to go more into financing the defense and, and uh, investing in the weapon market, etc., etc. And then, uh, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what will happen then. Um, yeah, but the, the, first, the first option makes me more hopeful, obviously. I will try to answer your first question, uh, Jamie. And um, at the end of my answer, you will all understand where I'm sitting, why I'm sitting to the right of all the other speakers. Um, yes, uh, GDP uh, matters um, in geopolitics. It's one of the power factors, not the only one. Uh, civil society, the uh, strength of um, democratic institutions is a power factor uh, as well. In fact, we, we see that in Ukraine uh, today, I think. Um, but since GDP matters, um, uh, that's one of the reasons why the degrowth movement should care about uh, geopolitics. It is too easy to say, for example, that all arms production is by definition wasteful, while at the same time we're doing all we can in the EU to have our arms factories produce the ammunition that U Ukraine uh, so desperately needs to withstand the Russian aggressor. Um, also, it is unsure whether Europe can continue to count on the protection of the United States and the support of the United States for uh, Ukraine. Do we really want to be at the mercy of Trump or a Trumpist? Uh, you cannot collect a peace div dividend with uh, war at our borders. Um, if degrowthers care about democracy, they should also be prepared to defend democracy when it's under attack. Um, the real waste of resources is not defense as such, but the fragmentation, duplication, uh, lack of interoperability between the national armed forces of the EU countries. We could get so much more bang for our buck if national governments would get serious about defense integration. We could double our combat power while spending no more than 2% of our GDP on uh, defense. 2% uh, of GDP, 300 million euros, billion euros, sorry. Uh, that's doable even for a post-growth uh, EU. We could still have high quality public services. In fact, I would propose that defense, diplomacy and foreign aid should also be included in these high quality public services that degrowth uh, pleads for. Um, so now you know why I'm sitting uh, to the right of the other speakers. Thank you. Um, if, if the European Union was to be a, a real degrowth um, area uh, and, and a new uh, model for, for the world, uh, it would have consequences uh, for, uh, in foreign uh, uh, policies, of course. The first one would be trade. Uh, it's already been said, but I would like to give a very simple example. Um, uh, the Commission has now uh, finalized a trade agreement with New Zealand. Um, we're going to have to vote it in Parliament soon. Uh, this uh, trade agreement is uh, not only the best that has been ever been done, but it's very innovative on a number of things. It has human rights uh, requests in it that had never been there, social rights requests that had never been there on data protection and all this. Um, it's, it's quite amazing on a number of things because it is shifting the way the trade was uh, uh, organized. That being said, of course, for us, the Green Group, for example, it's a very difficult uh, call. We don't know what to vote on it. It's a, a di difficult discussion for us at the moment because on one hand, should we encourage this very new way of seeing trade and, and this could become a model of every of what we want as trade agreements with the rest of the world and on the other hand it's still a trade agreement and in it you've got the idea of getting Zealand sheeps 
in, uh, coming to EU. Do we need meat coming from, EU, from New Zealand? No, I don't think so. I think that we should have our meat, they should have their meat. Yeah. There are things that we should trade, but this is things that we should, we're not capable of, of doing ourselves. But this is still in the trade agreement. And, and so this is the question. I mean, um, trade agreements is a huge part of the way that EU function. Um, and, and this will be a question if we go to more and more degrowth EU, which I think we should. Um, I think another consequence, of course, will be indeed a new geopolitical way of doing things. On one, one hand, it would make us less independent, less dependent from the bad boys. I already said, you know, we're only shifting, we're getting energy from other bad boys than Russia. But it's not only energy, it's of course all of the consumption that we're having, uh, all the trade we're making with. We, we need a number of, of um, of things coming from, as you know, from China, for all of our renewable energy. For the moment, we are not capable of, of, of doing a number of, renew, of, of, of renewable tools without a number of components coming from China. So if we were to stop that, it would be very good. So it would make us less dependent. On the other hand, indeed, we would come into this discussion of um, if we don't have these uh, agreements, what sort of diplomacy do we have here? And so there I come back to what Richard said. And indeed, if we don't do, for example, our own military thing, there again, very difficult question for the Green Group. The Green Group has always been uh, uh, advocating peace, peace. We were very much into it. Some of our green parties are even uh, uh, have it in their statutes that they have to always defend uh, peace. Austria, for example. Um, and on the other hand, when we wanted to help Ukraine, so when we had to vote, all of the big uh, questions about do we relaunch uh, uh, an army industry uh, ammunition industry in, in EU, do we, do we agree on the fact that all of the countries are going to put their energy together and not do each of them their own things? It was difficult discussion. So all of this, the diplomacy, I mean, um, there's, there's really a lot that would be good if we were not, I mean, the French, for example, are going to invest, as you may know, a lot in nuclear. Uh, I want there to stress the fact that we the bad guys were Germany for a long time, but the next bad guys will be France because the ones that today are trading with Russia for nuclear things is France. So it's very good that they are saying to Germany, you were very bad on gas, but now they are doing the same trade uh, decisions with Russia because they need it for nuclear. So if we were to stop that, that would be very good. But we can see that there would be a lot of things that would need to change in the way that we have um, uh, discussions with the others and we affirm our authority, our legitimacy, and we avoid having big powers taking the powers for. And the last thing that I want to say is that, of course, if we were to become a degrowth EU, we would need to go on thinking how we reimburse the debt we have for countries like Africa, because you know, if we just say now we're self-sufficient, we come out of the big discussion, international discussion, no more our problem. But we did get where we are because we went to talk, take all of these things, specifically in Africa, but also South America and, and elsewhere. So it would also mean that we need to find other ways. Uh, uh, because for the moment, indeed, we have uh, sometimes we buy things and all this that means that we do give a bit of money to these countries. Most of the time, anyway, it's not sufficient already and it's very unequal, but we would need to really uh, um, uh, improve that, that compensation. Thank you. I would like, uh, you said all very interesting things and meaningful. I would like just to comment and add the opportunity on, on this degrowth, Europe, EU degrowth, degrowth is really significant. And significant in a way that uh, the EU must not stop thinking about how taking the resource as it is, how, or in just a refined uh, stage way. I'm going to give just example of the green hydrogen. No, 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 this the most fashionable discussion around green hydrogen imports from other countries, Milano, Morocco, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, yeah, uh, racing who's gonna be the best to provide to your EU this thing. But for us, there is a real opportunity to not import the green hydrogen as it is. Now this, uh, 
we have like Egypt and Morocco that are exploring this uh, this piece uh, right now is to export the green fertilizers. So to use domestically this green hydrogen and produce green fertilizers and then export the green fertilizers abroad. So this way we, ha we will enlarge the supply chain within the global south, within the developing countries and shrink this supply chain for in the north that will create like kind of balancing on the degrowth models so this is like a small one but we have a lot of others uh, other other cases or other examples with him if we bring this you, you, we talk now extractivism and we commented about we about the renewable energy uh, and the green energy green energy transition the just transition we are talk a lot about within the green tra energy transition we, we talk about the yes, renewable energies but we much less about energy efficiency it's something like we we avoid because it's very hard it is very difficult because it's disruptive of all the industrial processes it is sometimes it can be uh, expensive to change all the industrial processes that already uh, are already in place but it is very important it has to be higher in the agenda uh, as much as the renewable energy implementation which is something we advocate too but really the energy efficiency thing needs to be to go up then for the extractivism we talk about the critical minerals you know now china has the most critical minerals of course it has a big geopolitical influence around it there is kind of uh, cart cartelarism that they say yeah they like form cartels around these critical minerals now new opportunities appears like a case of morocco with some critical minerals with cobalt and critical minerals and we saw amazingly how the geopolitics change it over this issue we suddenly you know a case uh, f f that uh, that the country had been fighting for dozens as dozens of years maybe 16 years around the the in the the, 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 the west of the sahara and now we see that the us suddenly Ag agree, um, uh, agreed on uh, on on validating the Moroccanity of the Sahara. We we have we have Israel, we have uh, Spain, we have a uh, lot of country, other countries that came that were really um, uh, not reluctant but hesitant. But just after this uh, discovery of those critical minerals and the potential of of it, it's. It was like the crucial, uh, the piece, the lynch, the lynch pill piece that drove those decisions. So that this shifts about other geopolitical, strong political allies because it has critical minerals. But in the other parts, we, it, the, uh, there is a plan or a policy into having uh, like uh, manufacturing electrical batteries in, in a part of Morocco. And it is envisaging to do that in collaboration with other African countries. So to form like a block to manufacture and deliver some uh, in uh, EV bat uh, electrical batteries. Uh, but in here we find like that the EU is stopping the market. They are trying to build up something and to strengthen the supply chain in the south and building uh, this kind of growth. But somehow the eu resists to that it just wants it in in the other way and doesn't want to 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 engage in it there is just uh, the the last uh, uh it was me that was the last idea that i wanted to add it was about yes the the, the influence of the eu the growth or let's say sustainability of climate policies uh it had a significant impact on moroccan strategies and policies uh, since the announcement of the carbon adjustment, uh, the border carbon adjustment mechanism, uh, Morocco, because the EU is the main trade uh, trade partner, uh, it was disruptive. All the industry in the ecosystem was in panic, in complete panic. What we are going to do? 
uh, and this made them like out of their uh, comfort zone in somehow and now we have finally i've been working in, in industrial pollution like for 15 years and 10 years on the ground facing industrial i know how when the, the talk to discuss with them with all the resistance they present on sustainability issues yes but since that it shifted the priorities we have a decarbonization industry decarbonization strategy now and they are starting to mobilize around it, the funding, how we are going to approach it. So that was one of the positive influence of those kind of policies on, on, uh, on, uh, on southern countries. Thank you. Thank you all. I'd now like to make some time for questions. We've got 20 minutes left. We've got one at the back and another one on that side. Um, and one here. Maybe let's do one, two, three, and then we'll have some more. I think you should just speak loudly. I think this is the only mouth in the mood. And I'll. Okay, thank you very much. One at the back there.
Thank you very much. There was one near the front here. Yes. Um, so three points. Um, Degrowth needs to continue to be a strong advocate for peace against militarism. Another one calling for stronger reflections on international affairs, dynamics within the Green Union, um, within the Degrowth movement. And then finally, this last this last point on European values and what those actually mean in Europe's relation with uh, global South countries. So when I was mentioning the climate science and that I believe in climate science, um, I did not say it explicitly, but I 100% also meant current and future conflicts over the resources. And obviously, this war has so much to do with resources. But the, the statement and the I think the attempt of maybe the international media, I mean, it was also a surprise to me how much attention was given to the character of Putin and trying to understand his dark soul and what is his motivation, what does he want, what do you think he wants, what is he gaining from it? Like, this, this therapy session that was going on for, for too long is honestly not what should have been covered because what should have been covered is the history of relations of the Moscovia or Russian Empire or so Soviet Union with the neighboring countries. And what was the nature of it? How did the Soviet Union treat the steps in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan? And what came out of it? Well, there are no steps in Kyrgyzstan, sorry, Uzbekistan. Uh, but I mean, the resources in general, the natural resources, the Aral Sea, just go and ask the people in Central Asia, uh, like what happened with them during the past 100 years. And not all of them would be actually able to tell you the honest response because there was no reflection. And I'm not even talking about um, academia and research on, on imperialism in the region. People would hardly find the region on the map. And there's only Moscow that they know about and there's only Putin that they know about and, and read about his character and, and his motivation, etc. This is not about Putin. This is about resources, exactly. You are exactly right. And um, 
The second point I wanted to make is it's much more difficult. And it, I mean, it's not uh, easier for me uh, to talk about Ukraine and war just because uh, I live there. Um, I was a pacifist until 24th of February of 2022. I hated the idea that there could be uh, something like attacks in school in the US, you know, when you read these news. And, 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 and honestly, it was obviously associated with, with the far right and being an activist, uh, uh, pro-LGBTQ and, 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 and gender activist, etc. It was the opposite of what I wanted to see and to have. But when around 5.30 a.m. I woke up from the explosions outside my window, I suddenly realized that, okay, maybe being a pacifist is a privilege in some cases. And peace has never came to me as, as a privilege as well, which maybe was taken for granted for a long time and was also taken for granted for me, but by me, because for, I've been ignoring the war for eight years, honestly, like the rest of the world. Uh, I was living in Kiev and there were people dying just for me in Kiev not to actually notice that something is wrong. I mean, I obviously knew what was going on. It's, it's not the complete oblivion, but it's, uh, it didn't really uh, was an existential threat that you would carry around with you everywhere. And it is not an easy decision when you are faced with an existential uh, threat whether to go against some of the principles that you've had and change your whole identity and what you believe in uh, and, and go to like uh, military courses for the civilians to know how to use the gun is something I've never thought I would do and I hope I will never have to use it and, and do it. And uh, I don't actually own a car as well and I don't know how to ride one but it was a, it was a very strange moment for myself, for my identity also as an activist, to understand one year ago that maybe I do have to learn how to drive a car and how to shoot a gun just because this could be the skills that you need to survive. I still don't know how to do that. I guess I didn't prioritize it enough. And maybe I'm lucky that I didn't have to because Kyiv was occupied, not, not occupied, but was yeah, almost uh, f for a short period of time. But I don't know whether I would be sitting here if I would live in, in, in a different city and if, if I was born in a different city and if you would be able to hear my perspective even. Because I'm a privileged war experiencer that has uh, strong air defense in Kyiv. And when people asking about, so how things are, is your family safe? Well, we shot down 28 rockets this night and when I woke up there were chat the family chat, and uh, my mom and my sister who's older and my niece who's 18, they were writing, did you hear that? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay, okay. Because they live in different districts. And that's just because of air defense. And if we didn't have that, maybe I wouldn't see any messages in the morning. And I don't, I don't have an answer for you. Like I live with this question every day as well, but in a bit of a different reality. Um, I'd like to answer um, um, Diego's uh, question about the uh, uh, ecological impact of uh, armament. Um, I tried to look up some uh, numbers and the uh, greenhouse gas emissions as a consequence of the first year of the Ukraine war are about five times as high as the yearly uh, G greenhouse gas emissions of all EU uh, militaries. Um, which means that had we shifted some more of our weapons uh, to Ukraine um, before uh, the full-scale Russian invasions in order to deter uh, Putin from his uh, attack, we might have saved uh, tens of billions of tons of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And then, of course, there is the environmental pollution the total ecological destruction as a consequence of the war as well. So um, from an 
ecological point of view, I would say deterrence is better than uh, war. Um, uh, second remark, uh, we cannot uh, impose democracy on other nations um, that we have learned, uh, which we should help defend democracies uh, whenever they are under uh, threat, including through military uh, aid, um, air defense for uh, Kiev. Uh, and I, I would really call upon the degrowth movement not to look away from the threat posed by aggressive uh, autocracies. There's no doubt that the transition to a degrowth society must be democratic. In fact, to challenge the growth dogma, you need a civil space, you need democracy. Many of you uh, even want to expand democracy, uh, deepen it by extending it into the economic sphere as a way of overcoming the growth compulsion of shareholder capitalism. That is only possible if we protect the democratic institutions that we already have. Thank you. Thanks. There were quite a lot of hands before, so I'd like to uh, squeeze in any last questions, and then we'll have a final round. Uh, there's one straight ahead of me, one, two here, and one there, and that's it. So please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, two here. There's one just behind you, then I'll come to you. Thank you. Please. Thanks. And final remark here. Otherwise, it is automatically to be 
Thank you very much. Um, the lights are on, but we've got time for a kind of one minute final comment from everyone, but just really one minute. Anyone like to respond to any of these last four points? Otherwise, yeah, we've got one. I can try to answer uh, two questions. Um, um, if we think we should decolonialize ourselves from uh, NATO, I think the only option is a uh, stronger EU. Um, stronger EU in uh, uh, the foreign policy domain, domain, security policy uh, domain, domain uh, including uh, defense. And uh, well, actually that's what I pleaded for, to have more military integration uh, into the EU, because the present fragmentation is the real waste of uh, resources. Uh, and then about the, the know-how on, on how to produce batteries in Latin America. Uh, let me start by saying that it, it, it's up to the people in Chile or Brasilia, wherever, Argentina, to decide uh, whether they want to use their uh, mineral resources to produce batteries uh, also uh, for us. And um, even within countries with a democratic government like Chile and, and Brazil, this is a controversial uh, issue. We've seen that in the discussions on the uh, Chilean uh, new constitution, uh, for instance. And um, it is hardly possible to produce uh, um, energy metals and, and, and batteries in a completely clean way. But if those countries uh, were to decide that they want to produce batteries that we need, for our mobility, even in a degrowth scenario, I think they're in a quite strong negotiating position. Uh, because the EU wants to diversify, wants to be less dependent on uh, uh, China. And yeah, they should certainly demand that uh, this transfer of knowledge and patents uh, uh, take, takes place so that they, they really benefit to the full extent from the uh, um, the, the benefits, uh, uh, the better jobs, the better incomes, uh, the accrual of knowledge that this battery production uh, can bring. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start first with a general remark, and I hope you won't be offended, but I thought it was very funny that you had these big speeches about decolonizing, demasculizing, and all this, when you were all men, having very long speeches and not question, and being very affirmative about it. So just wonder about that. And, and I find it interesting that you are so sure of yourself, because I'm an MEP having to, every week, make votes that I find very difficult sometimes to vote. And until the last second, I don't know exactly what to vote. There was a time where politics were much easier, probably, but today, as we say, in this multi-crisis situation with the short term and the long term that you have always to take into consideration, I think that easy statesmen is not the best solution. Of course, yes, wars come, and, and this is not new. I mean, ecologists and degrowth people have been saying this for 50 years. All n the next decades will be about wars, about rare materials, about resources, nothing new there, and it's very sad, and Ukraine, Russia is one of this example, and there will be a succession of them. Of course, we could, anyway, big climate impacts, and I think that the last three summers have shown that very much is going to change things anyway, much more than all of this, and, and we will have to, we will live degrowth because of climate impacts, even in France, even in Germany, even in these so-called rich countries. We are already, I mean, I come from the Alps. We have no snow anymore. We have no water anymore. And we are seeing the mountain degrade in 10 years, not in, in 20 or 30, in 10 years. And also, of course, I think that what the Russian and the Ukrainian war showed very well is that the nuclear question is still awfully dramatically there, and, and tomorrow we could have a nuclear very dramatic incident because of this war. Now, as, and I, I think there's nothing to add to what uh, Olga said, I mean now, then you have Ukrainian citizens, and we meet them, and these Ukrainian citizens, and these Ukrainian women, for example, that have had 
you know, sometimes also lived through rape and, and all of this, they tell you, we want to be defended by you and we need you. So it's easy to say, sorry, but do wait for the long-term solution. We're not doing war now. We have to take that into account. And it's not a solution to say all blasted war, but I thought, I considered when I needed to vote that I was going also to answer the Ukrainian citizens now in this very six months where we had to answer. Um, and it, of course, allied, I mean, all of this needs to go, and we've said it, with democracy and all of this, and this is my big, big worry, the authoritarian path and threats. Now, on the last, uh, the remarks that were there, of course, I said, if we were to be uh, a degrowth European Union, we need to change everything. So, yeah, financial, big rules, international rules. I mean, there again, that has been said for 30 years, so nothing new. Cancellation of debt. I said we have a debt to these, towards these countries. Changes in political economy. Where I don't agree is I don't think that I am not going to um, renounce the idea that democracy is for everyone, freedom is for everyone, rights and civil liberties are for everyone. I am not going to renounce on that. And I don't think this is being moralizing and all this. I take a lot of distance with the universal uh, arrogance of the French and their fundamental rights, um, droit de l'homme with a big H and never woman, of course. And, 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 and Western countries and America have been making huge mistakes, not because they wanted democracy, but just because they wanted their interest to be, to be served and they instrumentalized democracy. That has nothing to do with the fact of helping civil society, citizens' participation, uh, ground, uh, you know, roots, uh, uh, people everywhere, and I see that a lot, for example, in the Balkans, what will save Western Balkans and will prevent Western Balkans to go to Russia and will help them face um, uh, Vucic and others of these authoritarian people that they have is civil society. The, the, the work that is done in Serbia, which I follow very much, I am always so amazed about it. And to finish, I also think that until the day where we have this degrowth world that we all hope for uh, uh, and we also try in our everyday life to, to adjust with, but we are not that many, you know. Most of my colleagues, they take a plane to go from, you know, sometimes Paris to Brussels. They take a plane to go from Lyon to Brussels, which is a four hours TGV, very quick, very easy. So, you know, we're not there yet, but the day we're there, until that day, we will need industries, and I think that for me the most important thing is that it's not in an equal way where the polluting industries are in one place, the extraction is in another place, um, sectorization, tellerization. I think that's the important question. The question is for all of these people also to decide if they want industries, well, at least they need to have their own engineers, they need intellectual property, very important, you're right. I mean, what we don't want is this system we had we've had for years where we use the others, we have the intelligent people, we have the clean work, we have, uh, and we then uh, put the pollution and, and the very bad con working conditions elsewhere. Thank you, Hatch, our final word. Thank you. Last comment, uh, just very briefly, about the, industri the industrialization in Latino America. Uh, Yet, yeah, there is a point over there. That we, we need this capital investments. The investment capital is the key word for Global South development. Then the capacities, as Gwendolyn says, when we have building up internal domestic capacities and we need to develop how to mobilize these development investment capitals, then we can have what more supply chains developed, etc. I agree with the colleague on, yes, what we lack analysis on. Uh, there is a huge power shift happening in the world. Uh, we are living, uh, we, we are really, really in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a big shift and transition. The BRICS uh, brings a lot of questions to us. Uh, so, yes, we need to analyze more what is happening and how uh, this will influence uh, 
uh, the, the economical world away from US and EU and how EU and US are willing to interact with this new. It is very shocking in somehow how to see this new block uh, with Russia, China, uh, Brazil, South Africa, and now Saudi Arabia, Emirates, uh, and uh, yes, that's that's uh, that's a huge thing that we need maybe to discuss further and to watch in very closely. Uh, who are critical? Uh, oops, I'm shocked, sincerely. <laughs> it's really why we are speaking about renewable energy in this conference. So. Ener growth is energy. Energy is growth. We, if we, we, we are relying, the world is relying on fossil fuels. Those fossil fuels brought us to where we are here in this alarming situation in global warming. From here to 2030, we have like now less than seven years, six years. We have no, we will have, we have, we are the only generation that has, uh, uh, has now, the, the, the little space to do a real change in the impacts we are going to suffer worldwide, globally. Renewable energy are part of the solution. And if the solar, ener solar energy um, consumes critical minerals, yet it is an issue, but it is not something we have to dismiss in this conference. It is very important because solar energy is one of the, is the most renewable energy that provides the independence, the democracy of energy. So you have rural area, really uh, externalized and poor people that when they have solar, they can create real value, independence, create life and other social economical benefits. So this is the place where we, ha are, we have to talk about this. And we are bringing classical minerals to say yes, it is a quite an issue that needs to be addressed, but out of question to, to dismiss it from the, the from the pick the big picture. Thank you. Hey, final word. Yeah. I'd like to address the first question on the the, the geopolitics of deep growth uh, and the EU role mostly was mentioned. So uh, thinking about the region of Eastern Europe, Caucasus and Central Asia, I was trying to also find an answer for myself, like what would I ask or what would I say the EU needs to do? And uh, the, 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 the issue is in the question as well, because we are right now in the EU and we have all these uh, discussions and, and, and resources to, to also come here and uh, yeah we are not in Kyiv so we don't need to think about the, the nearest shelter etc. It would be really interesting I think to have this uh, this kind of conference outside of the EU and what I'm saying behind this is um, I think that uh, obviously the, the influence that the EU policy has on the region of ECCA is big is huge is driving green policies as well how however ineffective they might be sometimes they wouldn't have been there in the first place the discussions wouldn't have been there in the first place and if the country has a strong social society and decentralization uh, then they can actually they can actually something good can come out of that and I think that the relationship of the EU towards uh, this region the Eastern Europe Caucasus Central Asia MENA region etc should be of a partnership and not of a patronizing nature and um, the, 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 there's been a, a news I've been hearing uh, that the Eastern Partnership countries like uh, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, I, the, this neighborhood group is, is planning to in, uh, include Central Asia as well. And this is again coming back to the difficulty of the point. So, okay, the EU influences the politics in Kazakhstan and they also dream about green hydrogen, same as Ukraine, being a resource again. Um, and if Kazakhstan doesn't have, doesn't develop uh, the civil society uh, quickly enough, which it, it is happening, uh, then this will stop at the uh, top. So this will be the government's uh, agreements and this will change absolutely nothing. The emissions are growing, like the, the, there's no uh, drop that, that we need to see. And obviously the, there needs to be work done on the ground and it is harder and it is more complex because, the, for example, if you are uh, in Kyrgyzstan, 7 million people, you are squeezed in between geopolitical interests of EU, Turkey, Russia and China. 
And do you think it's easy to make decisions in this kind of geopolitical situation? Of course it's not. Um, and all the water to Central Asia is coming from the uh, mountains and glaciers in Kyrgyzstan. So there's a whole complexity of issues that I've, I usually don't hear being discussed while the region is uh, getting closer to having uh, conflicts over water and over other resources. So uh, we do need to be more inclusive in this. We do need to have more discussions like this in other languages, maybe as well. Um, and when it comes to our region, maybe not in Russian as well, because all of the countries, all 11 countries of region have their own languages and have had them for hundreds of years. So these are all the questions that come to my mind uh, when it comes to the role of the EU in the neighboring wider sense of this word countries and of promoting the ideas that, that we, I think, share as basic values here in the room anyway, no matter how we would comment on, on this or that particular situation because this is not a linear linear world. Maybe it was never a linear world and we just like to think of the past as a better place and, and more simple times. Um, yeah, but I would I would uh, I would say this like partnership, not patronizing and going really local, remembering about the language. So yeah, this is what we are trying to do in, in, in Can ECCA, although obviously we have limited power and resources, but this is exactly why I keep working with the civil society and I didn't join the army yet. So, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So the geopolitics of post-growth are uh, changing. They're very complicated, they're important, and we need to keep on talking about it. That's why the Green European Foundation is working on this issue. If you want to hear more about the project, the research, uh, come speak to any of the Green European Foundation team here or about the conference, there's a stand. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you everyone who uh, came with questions, comments, and thank you to the panelists as well. Uh, it was a really, really good discussion.